Standing up in McKinney, this is According to Callus, episode 553. Today is part three of our series, right? The core principles, the Tea Party principles of yesteryear, if you will. And that means we're going to talk about limited government. That's right, limited government. Before we get there, let me remind you the best way you can help me continue to grow the show. Make a difference in the area that I live, you live, quite frankly, just to increase our voice. It's as simple as this. Like, share, subscribe, follow. I'm on the uh, podcatcher of your choice. If you'll just follow or subscribe to the show, that makes a huge difference. I am on the social medias. I have a page and a group at Facebook. Join us. And I drop in at MeWe and Gab. Um, I guess I have a presence there, but not nearly what I do over at Facebook. And someday, someday I'll figure out how to get over over on uh, Rumble and Brighteon and that kind of thing. But until then, here we are, and we're going to focus on, as I said, Texas, Collin County, and McKinney. Why? Because we can't fix D.C., Especially appropriate being that today's topic is limited government. So here we go. All right. So the core principles, right? The the Tea Party was created, depending on who you talk to, either 08 or 09, maybe as late as 2010. And the idea was, look, there's a whole bunch of us with disparate ideas of how we fix the government. The government's out of control. There's too many problems. It, It was spurred by the bailouts, right? Money for thee, but not for we, but you took our money to bail them out because they're, quote, too big to fail. And how is it that we benefit? How is it we, the people, benefit? Well, you could argue that they prevented some jobs from going away. You could argue that they gave us that uh, dead cat bounce. Whatever your premise is, fine. But they violated the major tenant, which is the expanded government in (laughs) massive quantities. And funny thing is, is government never contracts. Government never loses money. They may slow the rate at which they take our money. They may slow the rate at which I spend our money, but it still continues to grow year after year after year. And when they can't tax enough, they create more, which was the entirety of the purpose behind the Federal Reserve. If you don't read or if you don't believe me, go read The Creature from Jekyll Island or half a dozen other books on it that explain it far better in a far more detail than I could or want to. But when we're talking about limited government, especially where their Tea Party is concerned, we were focused on the idea that the government we have is crazy. Way too much of it, way too big. It had to be reined in. It had to be deconstructed. There's that dirty word again. (laughs) But after 10 years, it should have been self-evident that that was never going to happen. We won some major elections in 12 and 14 and 16 and even 18. we, We held our own, but alas, we did not see what we were looking for. We did not obtain our goals. We did not move the needle in the right direction. No, as a matter of fact, It just kept on growing. And the strange thing is, it doesn't really seem to matter who the president is. If you'll remember, most of this started under George the Younger. And then it continued what was, you know, prefaced, right? That's not the word. (laughs) Predated George the Younger from Billy. And then it went to the big O. And now we had the four years of Trump. The Donald... Oh, maybe he slowed it down a little bit. Maybe he threw a few wrenches in there, but he was overmatched. The entirety of the four branches of government, that's right, I said four, were arraigned against him or arrayed against him would be the probably the more accurate way to, to say that. And they didn't allow him to do 10% of what he wanted to do, 15% of what he wanted to do. It really doesn't matter. And Honestly, when you look at him and he's the latest, greatest hero from all wings of the party, well, except for the neocons, but they're a different story, but everybody right of center wants to believe that Donald, the Donald is the hero. Now, again, 
in the world we live in today? Yeah, he is. He's he's the best we got. And in fact, some would say he is all we got. So they're going to circle the wagons and make the big defense and hope beyond all hopes that he can make a difference. Well, there's three errors with that. One, you're putting all your hopes on a single person. Two, the executive branch only has so much power when the other three branches are arrayed against it and the majority of the executive branch doesn't want to actually carry out the off or <laughs> the orders or the authored documents they don't want to follow through on those right they they'll drag their feet and refuse to comply funny how that works when you do that under the current administration you get locked up or fired or booted and the previous administration before the Donald, it was the same way, but the Donald just honestly believed that these are good people and they wanted to do the right thing, or at least that's what we've been told to believe. Now, I don't know what's in the Donald's head. I want to believe and give him the benefit of the doubt. He's a 1960s era Democrat, a New Deal Democrat, however you want to classify him, but I believe and I have observed he loves his country he loves the people around him he cares but again we put all of our hopes and cares upon him we trusted him we expected him to do it all now in my world there's really only one person you can cast all your cares on and his name is not the donald and whether you like donald john trump or not You have to keep that in perspective, whether you're his biggest fan or you hate him with the hate of a million sons, to paraphrase uh, somebody else. That being said, he can only do so many things. And all of D.C. is either in panic or in defense. And quite frankly, they're going to burn him out. They're going to destroy him. If If he wins another term, I actually fear for him. That being said, what other choice do we have? We really don't have any good choices. Which, again, brings us right back to the preface of where I started this. You can only fix what's close by. That brings us back to Texas. That brings us back to Austin. Now, if you've been paying attention, the governor is rode in on the scene again. He's going to save us all by the latest border bill, which they're going to promptly get challenged in a federal court. And they're promptly going to keel over and pretend that the federal court has jurisdiction. You're either a sovereign state or you're not. You're either going to protect your border and follow the state laws or you're not. You're either going to pretend that what we do at the state level matters or you're not. See, And that's the biggest problem with any candidate that wants to run at the state level. They have to believe, they have to preach, they have to speak on the idea that the state does have authority. And the state can and should utilize that authority. If you want to limit government, if you want to maintain restrictions on over-expansive government, the only way that you can effectively do it is to check and balance it, is to use the federal government as well, you're not using it, but just see it for what it is and take your state government or various states governments and go after them and push back and hold the line and don't allow them to trample our rights. You know, the reason the constitution is re- is written out the way it is, at least the first 10 amendments, colloquially known as the bill of rights is they're restricting Congress from doing things. It doesn't say the states can't do it. It says Congress can't do it. Now, I'm uncomfortable, to be honest with you, with the states violating any of those same rights. But at the time that the Constitution was written, that was understood that the states could and should, if they wanted to, utilize that power to curtail rights or to interfere with those rights. That's how I would put it. Many of those states had their own government-sanctioned religions or forms of Christianity, if you prefer. Again, not entirely comfortable with that, but I at least can understand it. Some of those same states had some requirements on firearm ownership. Most of them did not. In fact, the ones that were there were really targeted. And again, that's kind of odious too, because you have the hindsight of 250 years. But at the time, it made sense to some of those people. 
You know, the Third Amendment made complete sense back then, and now most people can't even wrap their head what that all means. But again, it's there for a reason. It was there to restrict the powers of the federal government. That's how you limit government. You say, no, you can't do that. And if they try and do it, you just say, yeah, no, we're not going to help you. Yeah, no, we're going to prevent you. Yeah, no, it doesn't matter what your court says. Try and enforce it. We're the state of Oklahoma. We're the state of North Carolina. We're the state of Ohio. We're not going to do that. We're not interested. We're the state of Washington. We're not interested. It's interesting that the feds can browbeat and abuse us all the time and we all knuckle under unless you want to smoke dope. Then suddenly people get spines. Well, no, we want to be a bunch of potheads. You know, Colorado, Washington, Oregon, they all got away with it. Nothing happened. And yet the state of Texas cowers. We're the biggest, baddest state in this union and we allow ourselves to be trampled all the time. We're led by a bunch of cuckolds. That's what I've been heard. (laughs) That's what I've been told. And that's what I've heard, right? That our leadership likes being abused. They like watching the state abused. I don't know if that's the appropriate term, but I got to be honest with you. I can't think of a better one. How did we get here? How is it that we've got such an expansive federal government that we have no way of ever reeling it in? And how is it that when we look at the state government to rescue us or to intercede for us and to defend us, they can barely show up to the fight? Now, we got one man that works in Austin that apparently is willing to go fight. And they try to take him out. Now, whether you think the guy's pure as the innocent snow or whether you think he's guilty but a great guy anyway, don't know, don't care. We got one guy in Austin that actually fights against D.C. Now, what's funny is the governor, when he had the f- that position earlier, did those same things. But now that he's governor, he's got nothing. The vitality that he once had sailed out when he became the governor. Now, I'm not saying he's a terrible governor. In fact, I would say he's probably in the top five of the best governors in the country. But when... When you're looking at those governors, how sad is that? They're all pretty bad. I mean, even if you want to say Governor DeSantis is the best, which arguably is, does that really mean he's awesome or he's just not as bad? I mean, that's the situation we find ourselves in. We keep compromising. We keep sacrificing our our principles to practical outcomes. Sadly, that's what we're left with, right? The conservatives have sold themselves out over decades, and here we are. The constitutionalists have been sitting at the sidelines screaming and yelling, hey, you have to defend liberty. Hey, you have to protect those freedoms. Hey, these things matter. Hey, girls are girls and boys are boys, and they shouldn't go in each other's bathrooms. Hey, those Satanists want to mess with our children. Hey, those communists are indoctrinating our children, and nobody cared. They just turned a blind eye. They weren't interested in listening. They had zero desire of doing what they ought to have been doing in the whole time, which is defending and protecting the youth of our country. Doing what they could to keep that prosperity positive so that we could fund the important things the government actually has to do. I don't know, like defense. But instead, they made it a racket. Everything's a racket. Smedley Butler warned about this about 100 years ago, and apparently we didn't pay attention. Now, it's, it's kind of interesting to me that every time Hollywood, Holly Weird, whatever you want to call it, every time the mass media wants to describe tyranny, they use the Nazis. Now, that's not to say they were nice guys or in any way, shape, or form not bad. They were, clearly. Especially if you're in Eastern Europe. But... To do that and ignore the communists, which were far worse, killed more people. And quite frankly, I think the Germans might have been better Nazi, or I'm sorry, (laughs) better commies than they were Nazis. East Germany had an impressive machine. In fact, when the Germanys reunited, unfortunately, a large number of those East German apparatchiks moved in and became part of the 
West German or the unified German government. And I don't think they did anybody any favors. And it's really hard to see how this relates to the United States until you consider that we got our education system from the Prussians. We got our spy network from the German Nazis and the communists that were German. The seeds of our own destruction have been present at least since the 1780s, perhaps since the 1830s, depending on who you're counting, but certainly it was destroyed, right? The, the federalism, the idea that we could be independent sovereign nations, that idea was dashed on the rocks of the Civil War, but it doesn't mean it went away. It doesn't mean it isn't true. It doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It just means that for that time, it lost. And if you're going to push back and if you're going to make a difference and you're going to be successful in pushing back and holding a limit to government, that means you have to be willing and able to use the laws, to use the Constitution, which means you have to be competent enough to read and understand what it says. That's why education is so important. You cannot limit, you cannot hmm, protect or recreate a limited government if people can't govern themselves. This again relates back to personal responsibility, right? You can't have a limited government if you're not capable of governing yourself. You can't have a limited government if you have no fiscal restraint. We are where we're at today because we were set up to become this. Now, whether it was intentionally, I don't know. I'm not going to deal with in those conspiracy theories. The problem is, is almost every conspiracy theory has been found to be conspiracy fact. Whether it's six months or six years or 60 years, they always seem to be much closer to the truth than what the story is that we've been sold. Which Reminds me, if you want to talk a little bit about that, you can go back and revisit my episode from November 22nd, where I talked about this at length relating to the deaths, scare quotes, of four prominent individuals. Now, whether you like them or not, whether you think they were positive or not, in their own way, they wanted less government. Now, some of them actually wanted more government, but specifically in a specific area (laughs) to justify an outcome. They would have been fine and happy to do away with other parts of government, which is kind of a trade-off, one for the other, but at least it wouldn't grow. It wouldn't have grown into the monstrosity that we have now. And when we think about the monstrosity that we have now, and then you translate that in what we're dealing with in Austin, and you look at the guys in Austin, and they won't interpose. They won't stand in the gap. They won't push back. They won't do anything. So what does that leave? Well, that leads the counties or the cities to lead the way. Now, unfortunately, all the big cities are run by, well, let's just call them progressive, leftist, Democrat, socialist. They are in league with D.C. They prefer the outcome. They want a population of serfs. They want a population of neo-slaves. They don't care about you. And I don't care what letter is after their name. They have made that clear by their actions. Don't pay attention to their words. Pay attention to their actions. Look at what they do, not what they say. I'm here to tell you, it's disturbing. It's disappointing. But that's where we are at today. So when you look about looking back and you see the Declaration of Sanctuary Cities. Those were cities or counties that told the state government, yes, you created us. Yes, you control our funding, but we're not going to do these things. We're not going to help with these things. In fact, we're going to thumb our nose at the feds as well. Well, after a while, the states kind of figured out, well, you know, if the city's not going to do it, the county's going to do it. Well, we might as well have their back because they're, we need them more than they need us right? We, the people control the purse springs. If you don't do things, they get no money. They can't arrest everybody. They can't punish everybody. I mean, they can create more money for so long. We're, we're on the precipice, precipice of financial disaster. Like nobody has seen in, well, let's see. 
1400 1400 some odd years depending on when you count the Roman Empire collapsing that's what we're looking at right now I don't have an answer for that what I do have an answer for is we can preserve Texas we can preserve our state by taking swift and appropriate action at the county level and at the city level and to persuade and encourage and build up our state leaders to do the right thing and stand by us and toe the line and lead from the front. Now, maybe the current governor is not interested in doing that. Maybe Lieutenant Dan, ah, he's too busy casting checks. Who knows? I don't know. But what I do know is if we encourage them, if we back them, if we tell them this is what we want and this is what we need from you, maybe, maybe, perhaps they'll get out of that little daze that was put upon them by the money they received from the WEF and they'll focus on what really matters, Texas, the future of Texas. And again, that's pure speculation. I don't know. I don't care. Clearly, they don't have your best interests in heart. They don't have mine at heart either. And I'm one of them, supposedly. I've got an R after my name. I help them win elections, supposedly. And this is my payoff. Not a darn thing. Why? Probably because I haven't asked for anything. I mean, (laughs) what is it? Rush used to say, I'm powerful and influential member of the media. Well, I am neither powerful. I'm not sure how influential I am, but I guess technically I'm part of the media. I don't work for them. I don't work for you. I work for me. I'm here Because one, it's somewhat entertaining. Two, it's educational for myself and you guys. And three, I'm trying to make a point. I'm trying to save the Republic. This stuff matters. If you're not willing and able to push back and demand limited government. Now, this is the whole point. We've went through all of this and you're asking yourself, yes, but can you define limited government? Well, There's where it gets a little dicey. See, if we talk to our voluntarist friends, they would tell you that there should be basically no government. If we talk to our libertarian friends, they will say almost no government. And honestly, I don't agree with them 100%. They make very valid points. They make good arguments. But we're so far away from that because people can't self-govern that we're not able to even imagine getting that yet. But I'll tell them this, and I will tell you this. We should take three or four steps in that direction. I mean, there's minarchists. <laughs> there's just hardcore capitalists. But here again, this is the problem. If you're not going to be considered or concerned about your community, if you're not going to be concerned about your tribe, if you're not going to be concerned about your state, it doesn't matter how individual you say you are or you are. If you can't function and thrive in society because you're so self-important. Again, what can you do in Texas? Why does this matter? I'm getting there. (laughs) I think I've already given you a pretty good hint. You have to learn to self-govern. We talked about this in the previous two days. You need to learn to take on your own personal responsibilities. You need to focus on your own finances. You have to you have to build that responsibility amongst yourself, amongst your family, encourage it in your local community, your local churches, and then you can go to the state or the city or the county and say, hey, look, this stuff can be done. We don't need the city. We don't need the county to do all these things. Okay, fine. You want to talk about a safety net? You want to talk about taking care of the roads, you want to talk about parks, that's fine. We'll listen to you. And there's probably appropriate ways to fund some of this stuff, but we're punishing people for being successful. We're punishing people for owning their own homes, even though they technically don't own them when they have to pay taxes on them. But that's another story. We're in a situation. Oh, sorry about that. We are in a situation where we have to deal with the idea that we can't function without any government, but we have way too much government. So where can we agree that we don't need government to do these things? And I'll tell you at this point right here, right now, I'm not sure there's a whole lot we can do without, at least at the county level, probably at the city level. Now, I don't like that. I'm not happy about it, but that's where we're at. We can change that though. And as we change that, 
Some of that power devolves back to we, the people. Some of that power dissolves or devolves back to the individuals. Some of it will return to the city from the county, to the county from the state. We can localize as much as possible. We can focus on the things that we can affect the outcome on, that we can ensure a good outcome. And then as we move up that chain to the state again, we can say, we just need you to do these few things. This is what we need from you. This is what we're demanding you do. Now, some would say, hey, well, we just want you to protect the border. We just want you to make a treaty to ensure that our military bases don't go anywhere when we get our independence. We just want you to guide us through proper divvying up of the government lands that shouldn't be government lands. We just want to focus on how can we work well with what little tribal areas left in here or what areas that we could maybe resettle with some of the people that were displaced when we became our own nation. I mean, these are all legitimate things that could maybe be talked about at some point in the future, but we're never going to get there if people can't learn to take care of themselves. If people can't self-govern, they're never going to get that limited government. Now, we can cycle back to the other idea that we can scream and weep and cry that the federal government's too big and they abuse us and they take, or we can train, train up our children. We can train up ourselves. We can train up our grandchildren. We can set the example. We can build a network within our state to where we can build up the state leadership to where they actually have a spine and they're going to stand up against the federal government. They're going to say, thanks, but we don't need that. No, we're, we're good. That's fine. Oh, you you like Fort Hood, which you improperly renamed? (laughs) That's fine. We'll go ahead and lease it to you. We'll we'll put it on a perpetual lease where you're going to pay us for your government uh, stooges to stay there. Oh, was that mean? Well, I mean, they're working for the United States government, not the state of Texas or the independent Republic of Texas. Who cares? I mean, again, this is all fantasy. This is stuff in the far distant future, maybe. But if you can't think about these things, if you can't wrap your head around these things, we're never, ever going to get there. One one of the most frustrating things was, is we would say we want limited government, but a good number of our adherents were just fine with the latest spy program. NDAA, well, we must do that. And they would use the example that we have to pay our soldiers. You're right. We absolutely need to pay our soldiers. But do we really need how many soldiers we have? Do we really need to be in so many foreign countries? Do we really need this? Do we really need to spend, I don't know, what is it, half a billion dollars for a new airplane that barely flies in the rain? I mean, these are the kind of questions that people have to be willing to ask. Why are we giving all this money to the FBI when clearly they're more concerned about People that go and protest at school board meetings and people that terrorize entire cities and burn them down. They're hunting down people that peacefully protested. Meanwhile, people rioted for a whole summer. Not a darn thing's happened to them. Don't tell me there's justice. Don't tell me that people care about these things, but clearly they don't. But when you're going to sit there and argue for limited government, you have to be willing to visualize what can you do without Now, it's really easy to say, well, we don't really need an EPA. We don't need an OSHA. We don't need a Department of Energy. We don't need a Department of Agriculture. We don't need this. We don't need that. Yeah, it's really easy to say until you figure out all the strings that they've had attached, all the networking that they've done, and all the dependence that they've created. The only way you can do that is to build up individual resilience, individual responsibility, individual fiscal independence and responsibility. If you can't start with those two things, that what we seek now, limited government cannot, it will not happen. If you can't govern yourself, somebody else is going to govern it for you. They're going to govern you good and hard, I believe is the phrase. And no, I'm not a fan of that. No, I don't appreciate that. But it does remind me, (laughs) once again, the future looks like a boot stomping at the human face forever. You know, I've been honest, I, I kind of have a uh, an enjoyment of dystopian novels, right? I, I, I like to envision the worst case scenario 
so that I can relate on, well, we're not there yet. Well, it's not that bad. It, it buys me a little peace of mind for the time being. But that's getting harder and harder. <laughs> Everything that they do just keeps ratcheting up. So I got the tyranny on my right, the tyranny on my left, and I keep asking myself, what are we going to change and what can we do? And to be clear, because Lord knows some of this can be twisted, I'm not advocating you or I start anything, do any violence, break any laws that are felonies or anything like that. I don't want you to go do anything that would endanger yourself or your family. And quite frankly, I don't want you taking any retribution on somebody. The best thing we can do, and I've talked about this a little bit before, is just ignore them. You have an acquaintance that's a fed. They're not an acquaintance anymore. Now, maybe you want to keep one, right? You get in a little trouble. You got that little friend you can call up over there. Maybe I could see that. That might have some value, but you really need to have a friend that works over at OSHA, an IRS agent friend, an ATF friend. I, I, I don't know why you'd want that. Maybe you do. But maybe if there was as much derision for those career choices that they seem to have for carpenters, maybe we could improve our world. <laughs> but don't worry, I got two more episodes. That's all I got for today, folks. <laughs> And with that, this has been According to Callus, and I will see you on the other side.